uh, allow me to introduce Fabrizio Balabi, who, um, I must say, I, um, I know from time back, uh, at the time uh, when I was actually together with Andrea teaching in Indonesia, and I happened to even be in your jury. Uh, yeah, my diploma. diploma jury. Um, One of the only okay. positive voices. <laughs> Try, trying to salvage him from Valerio <laughs> Jatti's uh, uh, attempts to totally destroy it. Uh, um, nevertheless, today uh, Fabricio is a unit master, a professor at uh, AA school. Um, and that, of course, that is uh, a box which contains many things because there's many voices at the AA school. But I think increasingly, uh, his, um, I would say, project, if I could call it like that, uh, concentrates on um, uh, on architecture history. Um, I had the luck, actually, to be guided around by Fabricio uh, in uh, Napoli to see these very buildings he is going to talk about, uh, about San Felice. I think it's part of his uh, increasing fascination for uh, Italian Baroque, and then even more specifically, Napolitan Baroque. Uh, of which I would like to add, uh, Fuga is also integrally part, even though some people might consider him not entirely uh, a Baroque architect. But today um, there is San Felice's, um, I would dare to say, staircases, but of course much more than that. Um, San Felice is this Baroque architect, which I guess never anybody heard of until Fabrizio <laughs> decided to write an article about him. Uh, we in our studio we like very much uh, because as a third incarnation in this series of le lectures which we see or we feel related to metropolitan architecture, we felt uh, there's, a, there's a possible interpretation, of course there to be tested by Fabrizio, where um, this, this, uh, these big shared compounds with a high, I would say, level of individuality uh, seem to find their kind of common language in this particularity of, of this circulation device there. Now, I give the word to you for this yeah. one. Thanks a lot for coming. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Should I talk, talk in the microphone? Maybe. Do you, can you hear me? I would rather not. That's okay. Yeah, can you hear me? Okay. So I'm going to present the, um, the work I've been doing uh, the last couple of years. Now I've already moved on a bit, but on, uh, on uh, on San Felice in Naples. And this is a work which came out early as, as Kerstin was, uh, was hinting to through a fascination. There are these, these staircases which she has designed are relatively, let's say, uh, famous in Naples, not at all renowned, let's say, in academic circles abroad. And, um, and therefore, I, I very personally, let's say, started to go visit, visit them and become interested in them and started to do proper research to understand how, let's say, they had come into being. So to a certain extent, I think also in relation to the brief you're doing this year, this, I'll try with this presentation to address a very, let's say, peculiar and particular architectural problem, which has to do with, let's say, how to um, how to deal with staircases typologically within a building and in terms of their expression at the moment in time in which architecture still, well, almost still, um, let's say, um, expresses itself through a language. And, um, and then I will try to, let's say, address how they fit within a broader context uh, which has to do with the open stair as a typology, if you want which flourishes in 18th century Naples, so in the 1700. So, the basic problem in designing a staircase, which is visible on the facade of a building, is that if the flights run parallel to the facade, the windows or the arches by which they are lit form a diagonal line which cuts across the horizontal of the floors. Or, if the staircase is on a square plan with the flights running alternately parallel with the facade and at right angles to it, the openings on the landings will come at levels halfway between the floors. So this is um, a quote from Anthony Blunt, which I'm not sure you're all familiar with, but uh, he's an architectural historian, which is he's obviously dead by now, but he used to be the head of the Courtauld Institute in London, the personal advisor of the Queen's uh, collection of paintings, and uh, a uh, communist spy at the same time. And he wrote a beautiful book called Neapolitan Baroque and Rococo Architecture. Within the chapter on Santilice, 
he talks about this very peculiar problem, which has to do with, let's say, the challenge architects have been faced with since Renaissance, I would say, to deal with, uh, um, let's say, a misfit. So on the one hand, a language which has a certain series of rules, which, uh, let's say, in, in years, they try to figure out um, how, how to, let's say, transform into a proper architectural language. On the other hand, the necessity to, to apply these rules to buildings and typologies which they were not meant for. So I'll try to give you three cases uh, in which these problems occur. The first one, when the, the staircase runs perpendicular to the facade, we can see in Palazzo della Cancelleria here, where, let's say, the architect has tried to integrate them within the trabeation so that somehow, even though, in fact, it is a misfit, because to light the stair, you have to drop down the windows, there is an attempt to somehow amalgamate it in the, um, in the composition of the whole, right? So it's, it's, and we'll see that time and time again, it's always a matter of trying to hide this element, which in fact is endemic to classical architecture. It does not belong to it. So there, that staircase is this one here. Another example which we, where we have the staircase running parallel to the wall is in Palazzo Farnese, which is, let's say, hidden altogether. Yeah? So here the stair is lit from the top, and the windows are in fact walled out. Um, and possibly the third example is when we have the arcaded staircase, which goes up, right? Uh, on more than one level. And here we see this very peculiar problem of which San Felice is a master at solving, which is this. So this, this awkward triangle which occurs between the diagonal line of the stair and the base and the capitals of the column, which is to a certain extent a uh, Bistinia. I don't know how to say this, but it's a very... How do you say Bistinia in English? It's, like a cur it's an architectural curse, curse somehow. Yeah. It's something very wrong. And it's, an, it's actually an object of a very fierce debate between Guarini and another uh, architectural history, well, architectural theorist I will mention later, which is called Juan Caramuel. They talk, let's say, there is a, um, an exchange of letter precisely on this detail, yeah, on how to deal with, the, let's say, this combination of, you know, the classical orders which have a rule and this diagonal line introduced by the staircases. So, this is the staircase that San Felice designs for his own palazzo in Naples. In fact, it's one of the, let's say, the last projects um, which belongs to a series uh, in his own work. So it's, it's not one of his last projects because eventually he will live until the end of the 1740s. But this is the moment in which he is most busy, let's say, in, uh, in working um, for the local nobility. And uh, that has to do with a series of historical questions, which maybe I'll explain later. But in, in 1735, there is a change in the regime of Naples, which had until then be a, been a viceroyalty under the Aragonese, the, the Austrian Habsburg, and so forth. And in 1735, suddenly the Bourbons come to, come to Naples and bring with them a new series of architects and a new series of, let's say, concerns in matter of how they were to exert their power, architecturally speaking. So San Felice is basically out of the picture. So he will live another 10 years, but he's not very influent. So this is kind of the height of his career. As I said before, this, the discussion on his staircase in his palazzo is actually more interesting to see in correlation with let's say something which develops almost as a Neapolitan type, which is that of the open stair. And let's say there, there are a number of, of ways in which we can interpret this type, how it came into being. On the one hand, historians have um, followed the traditional path of starting with the masterpiece and in a sense, uh, how do you say, uh, referring all the later pieces to that. On the other hand, instead, we can, stay, we can see it as a very, let's say, matter-of-fact architectural problem which arises due to a series of um, very peculiar conditions the city of Naples has had in its development between the 1500s and the 1700s. I'm going to explain that later. We should probably briefly introduce San Felicia because I, I guess nobody has ever heard of him in here. And, um, this is a portrait he had made from, uh, of himself in 1735. Um, there are a few things which already make this portrait quite eloquent in terms of, for example, the architecture which is framing him. We see references to treatises in France, such as Philibert de Lorme's Le Tombe, sur l'architecture. 
and the inscription in the um, at the base of this this arch is uh, is very interesting. It says Ferdinandus San Felice Patricius Napolitanus. So it's basically the, the word architect doesn't even appear in this particular inscription. In fact, he is quite keen on uh, let's say clarifying or stating his, uh, his 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 state of birth. Yeah, he's a, he's a, a nobleman. Uh, belonging to the Seggio di Montagna, which is a very important, let's say, area of which at the time at least owned a very big part of the northern eastern um, part of the historical town in Naples. Um, he's holding books, yeah, which obviously may mean that means it's, 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 an, it's an expression of, let's say, a uh, certain cultural finesse and awareness of what is going around in Europe, as I said, which is further corroborated by, let's say, the particular elements which characterize this picture. So he is an amateur, in actual fact, not a trained architect in an academy, because Naples didn't even have an academy comparable to that of San Luca, for example, in Rome. And his education was, in fact, entirely crafted out of self-interest on books and working for a very famous painter, actually, called Francesco Solimena, which is one of the highest representative of late Baroque painting in, uh, in Naples. So, uh, in fact, it's interesting, he, he was, his, the, the, being a, a nobleman could, could have been a very, uh, how do you say, uh, could have put him in a position of extreme, let's say, advantage, because obviously he would get much more commissions, but in his particular case it was actually a deterrent, because his father had destined him for law studies, and it is only when the father dies at the, around 1693, if I'm not mistaken, that he is actually is able to um, embark in a career within the arts. So his brother, which was the Archbishop of Nardò, which is a very small town in Puglia, where San Felice eventually does his first projects, uh, talks, shows some drawings of his to this painter, Francesco Solimena, which was, let's say, the absolute superstar of the entire art scene in Naples at that time. And um, a particular painter, uh, let's say, very much in tune with, uh, with other Baroque painters around Italy, but famously, let's say, uh, a sort of anachronistic painter almost to an extent, uh, who is able to, for example, put, I don't know, the exuberance of Barocci and the, let's say, composition of Raphael within the same painting. So if on the one hand we have, let's say, you know, all the theatricality, which is, you know, which we which we usually assign to Baroque painting with diagonal compositions and the figures, let's say, come out, somehow concentrating at the center. This is the, 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 I don't know how to say it, the expulsion of Heliodorus from the temple. We also have a, a, let's say, a very composed set in which this occurs, which of course, you know, refers to the School of Athens, this very, very famous painting by Raphael, uh, which dates to 150, 200 years back. Um, so yes, this for us is, important because we start to understand how San Felice actually arrives at the building site as a decorator much more than as an architect. So as someone who works let's say within a condition which is given and then develops let's say a language in correlation to that somehow. And um, so his first let's say works on his own in fact consist of what were, were called at the time macchine da festa. So celebratory machines, in fact, which were um, ephemeral architectures for the celebration of important events within the city. For example, the coronation of a king, or the birth of a king's son or daughter, or the uh, how do you say the um, the um, uh, the end of a plague, for instance. And in fact, even though they were ephemeral, and obviously not much remains but the drawings of and the paintings of this structure, they were an incredibly important part in the, um, let's say, in the governmental dynamics of the city, yeah? So in fact, these were architectural machines as much as machines for consensus with which, let's say, the power that be would impress and please the population and, uh, and let's say, gain consensus by, you know, getting these very pompous and uh, exuberant manifestations of uh, power. Um, this is one of the first, actually designed by San Felice, and you know, we can already notice somehow a very, let's say, exuberant language, which has to do, of course, with the fact that these are temporary structures where architects would probably experiment much more than if it were a permanent building. 
But here it's carried forth to an extent where we have references which go actually beyond even European references. This has to do with a situation in which Napoli is at that time. So at the end of the 1600s, Naples is in fact one of the most cosmopolitan cities in, in Europe. Uh, it is third in size after London and Paris, so bigger than Rome in terms of population at least. And it is, let's say, even though it is a, um, a vice royalty at the end of the 1600s and even at the beginning of the 1700s, so it's not the capital of a reign until the Bourbons arrive in 1734, even though it is a vice royalty, uh, it still, let's say, attracts a big wealth of artists, architects, and uh, writers, for example, which uh, spend a very, very long time there and develop important works and, and let's say, contribute to a, a very large exchange of ideas. Um, which occurs there. One of them, for example, is Gaspar van Witten, which is a Dutch painter, famously the father of Luigi van Vitelli, which then would be the architect of the royal palace in Caserta in Naples, even though van Vitelli is actually brought up in Rome. Um, uh, another, for example, interesting, exam uh, interesting example is Fischer von Erlach, which spends five to ten years in Naples uh, when Naples is under the dominion of the Austrian Habsburg Habsburgs. And, um, and in fact, this is one of the last projects San Felicia does, which is an archi a, a machina da festa, so a celebratory machine to be built uh, here. And it was built, and there are paintings of it and everything, which quite curiously refers to or has very, very, a lot of analogies with the, the famous drawing of the pagoda in uh, the porcelain pagoda in Nanjing. And we are sure that let's say San Felicia has the chance to see the Antwerp, not only because um, we know that we know that Fischer von Erlach was in Naples for an extended period. In fact, he builds one of the biggest celebratory machines Fischer von Erlach ever to be uh, seen, which was called the Maestoso Teatro del Mare, the majestic theater of the sea. So it, it was a huge construction of, let's say, a circle of, I don't know how many meters in diameter, but there were basically in the middle of the bay, uh, a gigantic platform with two pyramids and a triumphal arch in the middle and they would have bullfights around and then a whole project of illumination with torches on the ocean which, um, which illuminated the entire gulf basically. So it was a gigantic project realized, we, ha we unfortunately have no trace of it visually or I have not found it but it's, it's in the chronicles for example of the city uh, different writers write about it and surely San Felicia was about 10 maybe when he saw this but surely, let's say, the entire city of Naples was exposed to the spectacle, and surely this would have given a strong impression to him. So that's, anyways, a side chapter, even though we'll see that motif of this stair coming back towards the end of the presentation. We should focus probably on what San Felice is most famous for, which is, in fact, these, um, these very famous, well, in Naples at least, uh, stairwells for palaces. And um, here, again, you know, the Austrian influence comes back also with other people, for example, Jakob Prantauer, which was one of the most famous architects at the end of the 1600s, also has a, a residence in Naples for some 10 years. Hildebrandt, together with him, comes to Naples, in fact. So, so in fact, the, there is a very curious, let's say, amalgamation of let's say, interests and architectural styles which comes to Naples, and obviously the architects there are very receptive to this. Um, the staircases of San Felice are a very curious phenomenon which, let's say, develops with, along two parallel lines. Uh, these parallel lines, in fact, give the title to the presentation. We have snails and we have hawk wings. And this is the description, actually, uh, the biographer of... Um, the lives of painters, sculptors, and art Neapolitan architects gives of these stairs. So this is, if you want, Na Naples is Vasari to a certain extent. Even though it's, it's actually not a very good book and it's even quite inaccurate in most of uh, the descriptions. But anyways, he gives this curious zoomorphic analogy to describe these two types of staircases, which San Felicia does. One, of, one type is the snails, so these are the stairs which develops, develop like a spiral somehow and which, let's say, as historians mostly associate with the Austrian model of the staircase in the hall. And then instead there are the hawk wings, which are, let's say, I would say an invention of San Felice himself. And the hawk wings are called hawk wings because they are, they look like a hawk with its wings open. 
And so these are the two types in probably two of San Felice's most, let's say, uh, or his best, let's say, projects. <coughs> One is the stair of Palazzo Bartolomeo di Maio, uh, which is an enclosed stair staircase in a, in a large well uh, with windows, obviously, in the courtyard. The other one is the one of his own. So the Hawking, you know, refers to this kind of geometry. Um, yeah, I'll give you a few examples. So one recurrent motif is that these stairs are always always work in, in close proximity to a courtyard. So you would access them through the main court of the building, and usually you would some Felicia would make you cross the entire of the courtyard. I explain why later. But anyways, this is a, a famous case in Palazzo Serra di Cassano. It's a bit of a unique type, so it's something that uh, San Felicia never develops again. This, and it is a, a stairwell which develops, let's say, within a large hall. So it's, in fact, two snails which start together here, then go up, and then meet together at the top again. And this has to do very much with how the users of the building would, uh, would access it, you know, with a carriage from here, crossing the courtyard, the carriage would step here, one guest or one person would go on one side, one on the other side, and then they would meet upstairs again. And it's, it's quite beautiful, actually, the way in which the hall is dealt with, which is entirely unadorned. It is a, a white, a huge white vaulted space, fairly abstract. And then you have the use of this very typical Neapolitan stone, which is piperno. It's like a volcanic stone, very porous and darkish gray. But here we can already see that some, something, let's say, interesting is going on in relation to the staircase we saw at Palazzo Barberini, so the Bernini one, where the balustrades are distorted to follow the geometry of the rail, yeah? And they're not straight with a little triangular, let's say, uh, um, yeah, stone inserted in between. So, let's say, the most famous one is the one I showed before, so Palazzo Bartolomeo di Maio. This is, it, it may look quite normal nowadays, in fact, it's an exceptional stair, entirely done with cantilevering vaults, which was a very difficult thing to do at that time, and with a very weird geometry and plan. Um, it is somehow, it develops with concave, you know, these concave sides which jut into the space, which give it a very, let's say, weird, uh, a weird, a weird present when you're in there. It almost seems like it's falling onto you. Again, here the reference is very clear and it's, it's the plan of, um, of the San Carlino. And, you know, this is like, it's no mystery. Uh, Borromini was probably the most famous and copied architect of the time, and mostly in, in Naples even more so. So this is an association which in fact make, makes very much sense. Um, the hawk wings, on the other hand, are more difficult to place within the history of architecture. This, as I said, is the one he built for his own uh, palazzo, which he does towards the end of his career. And they are usually placed at the end, or they always place at the end of the courtyard. So they make this huge uh, mise-en-scene at the end of the courtyard and leading to a garden in the back. And somehow, let's say, within the very uh, tight streets of Naples, they are a bit the true facade of these buildings. These buildings, you're never really able to appreciate them frontally as you would appreciate a palazzo, for example, or a square. In other Italian cities, you're always in very small roads, and I'm going to talk about that very briefly later. So in a sense, in seeing these, these, um, these, stair these staircases through the portals gives you, if you want, the, the, um, the grandeur which the facades were not really able to express, or which you could not really read in the facades. So here, obviously, historians have gone all over the place in trying to understand where this motif came from. There are, let's say, there's a very large bunch which associates it with a drawing from Palladio. But in fact, that's a stair in section, so it's never really shown in elevation, even though the drawing was very famous. And we know, again, that, that uh, San Felicia, through a friendship, was, uh, was not an expert, but had, had for sure read the, the books. Another... Um, Another case which is discussed often is Fanzago's stairwells to the, to, um, to the churches. This is a quite also a peculiar phenomenon to Naples because it has to do with the fact that these churches were inserted within the urban fabric and somehow you had to, on the one hand, elevate them from the ground and on the other hand, some, you wanted to align them to the buildings on the street because you didn't want to create a recess so that the church would not kind of 
manifest itself on the street and the streetscape. So you would have these actually stairs in in rooms. Yeah, which so this is a facade which actually gives on a stairwell, not on the church itself. And this is the stair that goes up. And here we can already start seeing a bit this diagonal motif, but I don't think it's particularly relevant. The most bizarre of all is in fact a stair in, um, in St. Jacob in Austria. And here a historian has made a whole investigation based on dates and uh, let's say on the possible um, kinships the two architects had. So this is Prant Tower in fact, which has been, had been in Naples, but the dates here and suggest that somehow they were not, let's say San Felicia was not aware of it and they're not particularly related. <coughs> It doesn't really matter. Uh, it's, pro it's much more interesting, in fact, to discuss the stairs in relation to, let's say, a few of the peculiar characteristics of Naples' morphology. So this is a map of Naples at the end of the um, 1500s. And in fact, it doesn't really change much for a hundred years or so. So I, I said before already, Naples between the 1500 and the seventh and mid-1700 is a vice royalty which uh, basically means that uh, the ruling powers never really invested on urban transformation there with very large projects, which for example we can see in other cities. In fact, the, these, um, the city of Naples always develops punctually with new buildings which are very big and grand, but which, let's say, only in, in the very long time spans have an influence on the immediate surrounding. In this case, what is interesting is that um, Somehow, what we get is that the, the urban tissue of the city remains pretty much a medieval tissue. So the plots are very, very small and, um, and fairly irregular in shape. And let's say the possibility to expand them is very difficult somehow. So architects are always faced, especially uh, in the 1700s, when, when let's say, uh, noblemen start to inhabit the city, to come back because the 1600s was a very bad period, there was a plague. Naples was a very uh, was fa famously very dangerous city to live in somehow. So usually nobility preferred to live outside of the city in villas. But uh, let's say what's probably even more influent to let's say the situation San Felicia finds when he goes to work, uh, let's say on these palazzos, is a series of uh, laws called Pramatiche Sanzioni, which Charles VI of Habsburg uh, puts in place one after the other which forbid the construction within the city walls um, and in, in the immediate outside. So what would occur basically was that uh, the only way you could not expand buildings at all at that time, and this was a, a measure to control the population, which was famously insubordinate, and let's say that's true also with the countrysides, which were becoming less and less operative agriculturally. A lot of people wanted to move to the city, so these laws are put in place to somehow maintain a balance between the population of the two. But in fact, they have the effect that the city still grows, but only vertically and on the existing tissue. So what we get somehow is these buildings, these blocks, which are six to seven or eight floors in height, which is very unique, but which retain a very small footprint. And that, for whoever has tried to design, a pal uh, let's say a palazzo with a courtyard in, in such a situation, is a very difficult design challenge. So this is, let's say, an average, if you want, block taken from the Partido Spagnoli, which is one of the most, in fact, regular parts of the city. And in black, there are the staircases. And here you can see that this idea of the staircase at the back of the courtyard is, in fact, as much a uh, vernacular, if you want, response to a series of climatic and, uh, let's say, uh, if you want, urban conditions than it is, let's say, an artistic, if you want, ex uh, decision. Um, so, in the work of San Felicia, probably the first case in which we can find a very interesting response to this condition is in fact Palazzo Laureano, which you visited, right? Yeah. So this is a palazzo which San Felicia builds for his cousin, who had just married and wealthy of his wife's dory, so the money you get when you marry a woman, um, decides to renovate, let's say, a property he has um, in the old town in Naples. So the the building is this one here, and it's, it's actually in a quite interesting place because it's this, you see that it's all quite a mess, but generally, let's say, on a grid, and suddenly here you have a circle, and that's because that whole 
block, that whole chunk used to be a Roman, was built on the foundations of a Roman, of a Roman theater. Um, therefore, let's say you can still find the piers actually of the theater in the city around. So it's here. And here we have a few interesting architectural maneuvers which St. Felicia does and which, let's say, are interesting in relation to um, a series of tendency which have to do with nobility, how nobility would live at that time. So this is how a typical, for example, palazzo staircase would work. You, you try to put them as close as possible to the entrance so that when you arrive, you go up to the stair. In this case, we have this peculiar thing that the stair is moved actually at the very far back. This is interesting for two reasons. The first one is like a very strong relationship which you kind of arrive at establishing between the streetscape, between the street view and the stair at the back. The second one has to do with the increasing, let's say, popularity reception used to have in the, um, in the 1700s in Naples. So the idea of receiving guests and placing the stair at the back would have guests go through all the display rooms before you would arrive to the main living room. So in fact, you would experience as a guest a larger extent of the palazzo and therefore be impressed if you want by all, let's say, the features on display in these rooms, such as books, um, paintings, and so forth. So, um, the, let's say, this building, sorry, this building uh, here is not the first case, in fact, in which we see a rhomboidal stair. Yeah? It's shaped like a diamond. This is a motif which San Felice develops in a few other staircases before. So it's, it's turned, in fact, 45 degrees from this type of staircase. And that uh, has to do with the fact that in that way you would arrive in the center of the rooms rather than on the side, which is a very undesirable place to enter a room. Uh, of course, that also creates another series of consequences, which, uh, let's say, are, are very interesting, for example, in relation to how you see the stair developing in, uh, at the end of the court, so when you experience it frontally, you see it developing like that, rather than parallel to the wall. So that's, we go back to that problem we described at the beginning. So you touch it with the minimum point, which is the landing somehow. And uh, on the other hand, let's say the, the vaulting becomes an incredibly, let's say, interesting question too. Now, with the palazzo I showed you a picture of before, what's even more interesting is that the staircase is doubled. So you enter from one part and you can go up in either direction. So it's not just like this one where you go like this and then you're forced to enter here and for example to access these rooms you have to go through the entire palazzo. At one, at one point here the staircase is doubled so that at every landing you can enter on both sides. And this makes it possible that you don't need a loggia in front of the stair. So if here for example you would have a loggia here which would distribute on one side and the other let's say the, the people, depending on where they wanted to go in the palazzo, or in, in the case of Cinquecento palazzos, all around the courtyard. In the stair, um, San Felice proposes in Palazzo Lauriano, in fact we have, let's say, a symmetrical stair which, let's say, rids itself of the loggia, and therefore, if you want, um, results in more, let's say, cohesive and unitarian, if you want, scheme. On the other hand, it's also like a very monumental gesture, which, uh, of course, has a whole series of expressive consequences. The other thing which is interesting is that here the stair, let's say, invades the courtyard, so it's not relegated behind walls anymore. And this, historians have, let's say, uh, justified by the fact that these windows were existing already before. So, in fact, this was a way to somehow not touch the windows which would light existing rooms, yeah? And therefore, the palace already existed before the, the staircase is the insertion, if you want. And this is the typical situation in Naples at the time. Architects would very rarely get a commission to design the whole palazzo, or to rebuild the whole palazzo. Um, but at any rate, uh, let's say here, you know, by, by means of this invasion, we are exposed to that very tricky moment, which what Blunt was describing before again, which here is, let's say, very eloquently solved, but we'll talk about it more uh, in his own part, so where it's even more re refined. I'll just show you a, a, a few pictures of, let's say, how this presents itself when you arrive there. So there are these two staircases going up, and then you have the situation where doors you know, repeat themselves at, at four floors. So it's always the same, always as you go up. Sometimes you have stairs which allow you to mitigate between levels because obviously not all, if you, if you have a staircase which is so, let's say, uh, repetitive, you don't, you don't always get at the same 
let's say, level in the floors. So a quite interesting series of measures, if you want, which repeat themselves one on top of the other. Uh, then the other thing which is quite impressive is the way, in fact, the windows are developed, which uh, are from here look fairly normal, but in fact are, are a very carefully designed detail, which is quite unique in the history of architecture entirely. So this is a scheme which, let's say, shows us this window in plan. It's quite impressive because, let's say, first of all, San Felicia lines the, um, the edges of the window to, let's say, the view you would have of the palazzo, right? So that somehow you would never experience the thickness of the wall in its entirety. But on the other hand, he kind of undoes this measure by developing this weird detail which has a double effect of sorts. So you, in fact, have a sense of depth, but it's a fake depth. So in fact, it looks very slim, even though it's a monstrously big window. And, uh, and this, let's say, is, you know, you actually understand when you're on the other side of, of, the, of the window, of the, or of this opening, and uh, it's kind of significant of the importance, for example, that this architect in particular was giving to the gaze of this window from the moment in which you enter. Yeah? It was a very theatrical sort of moment, which, which is something actually typical of Baroque palaces, which start to achieve a directionality in relation, for example, to Cinquecento palazzos, which, where the courtyard usually was something harmonious on all sides and which usually tried to establish, let's say, a, a core. In Baroque palaces, I'll show you later, there's a drawing of Palazzo Matte in Rome, which, which Wolfling, for example, um, deals as, a, as like an exemplary reference. We always have, let's say, a certain axial relation to the space, <coughs> which then, and in particular, let's, well, I'll, I'll just show you it. So, we'll move to his own palazzo, which is in fact maybe the last building I'll talk about by him. Uh, it's a project which lasted five to six years to construct it. It's located in a very, let's say, at the moment, um, folkloristic area of the city. So you can buy, for example, a flat inside it, a nice big flat for like 150,000 euros. And uh, it's quite grimy, it's, it's more or less falling apart somehow. But um, anyways, it was built in a a borgo, so a very small settlement just outside the city walls. Um, in fact, it was an illegal settlement. And this is important because we have to understand that the geometry, in fact, of, of the palazzo and this weird, let's say, uh, situation which arises from it is, is contingent to the fact that here some Felician had to work with existing foundations and that these foundations were most probably um, the foundation of an, an inform, of an informal construction. So, in fact, it's a very tricky case to work with. If we look at the plan of the palazzo, this is kind of the extent of this plot, with the garden at the back. Uh, San Felice uses it, divides it in two courtyards. Each courtyard has a stair, and each courtyard is dealt with, let's say, differently somehow. And uh, so. When you would see, for example, this building from the street, it has two portals. These are all photographs by Anthony Blunt, by the way. It has two, which goes there in the 60s to document. Uh, it has two portals. One, let's say, gives you a direct view onto a snail, and the other one gives you a direct view onto a hawkwing. Now, these two uh, courtyards are interesting in relation to one another because uh, San Felice here does something which it becomes increasingly a tendency uh, at the time, which is that he builds a palazzo for himself, of course, but actually rents an entire floor of it. So, in that case, he would use the courtyard with the hop wing, and let's say the, the tenant of the first floor, which I'll show you on the facade in a minute, instead would use the other staircase. That doesn't mean that they would live in separate courtyards. Both, both of the apartments actually developed across, along the two courtyards, so on one entire floor but they just had a different means of access and also actually a very different experience of access. So this, you can see it in the quite, let's say, peculiar relation between floors. So the, the Piano Nobile is actually the last floor, which is San Felicius. And uh, the slightly lower Piano Nobile is the one that he would rent out. And then on the bottom, obviously, servants and so forth. Um, yeah, here's a plan. I'm gonna quickly show you the stairs now, how they work, let's say, in relation to the access of entrance. But effectively, 
let's say this this was the means of access for the uh, the tenant. This was the means of access for San Felice himself. And the two courtyards are let's say develop let's say in relation to the stairs, but also develop with their very different motives on that. So here we can see that the edges of the courtyard are like trimmed off and. That you know is an expressive trope, which again is actually typical of Baroque architecture. But it's more interesting to see how the stair develops. So it's two snails which touch each other after one round, in which they go up, and this gives a quite, let's say, interesting theatrical effect when you arrive. So it it starts as one stair, which then let's say splits in two, and then the stairs goes around goes around this very thick. Uh, nozzles, yeah. So yeah, here you can see it developing. This, this is a diptych which shows you more or less the experience you'd have when you arrive there with these two stairs departing, and then yeah, you come up from here and you arrive in the hall where they come back together again in a vaulted hall, which is illuminated from the back with the, these windows. Um, yeah, this is the plan. Again, here historians have suggested, that in fact, this. Uh, comes from a stair, again from Fischer von Erlach, um, for his cathedral in Salzburg, which is the stair at the very, very, very far back. It's something you wouldn't experience if you go to the church, because it's reserved to the priests. But in plan, it's significantly similar, in fact, to that of St. Felicia in that stair. On the other hand, there is the hopwing, which again, you know, is placed symmetrical to the courtyard somehow, uh, sorry, sorry, to the portal, and then also here, it's, it develops around the same motif. It's two stairs which go up and up together. So here we see it. It's located at the very far back, and it creates this kind of very theatrical sort of backdrop to um, to the daily life in the palazzo. Yeah. So it, it almost, in fact, they almost, in fact, look like the the um, the niches you would have in a theater. Yeah. To look at the performance. Uh, this is the drawing actually I was talking to you about before. So the, this this drawing, it's one of the only drawings that Wolfling includes in the Renaissance and Baroque book when talking about the Baroque Palazzo and on this idea of the, um, let's say the directionality of it. So this is Palazzo Matei in Rome, which has the loggia famously only at the back, which frames, let's say, an entrance to a garden behind, which uh, I guess here is interesting in relation to the case of St. Felicia. Because it develops around, along the very the very same motif, but then again here, you know what I was saying before. It's interesting because he gets rid of the loggia, and somehow um, joins stair and loggia into one element, which also has let's say this very let's say representative and theatrical mm -hmm. let's say effect, and which also let's say allows all the the let's say the people in the building to access the floors individually. So in fact now there are more than 40 units in the building. So the, the rooms have been chopped up in corridors and so forth, and all are access to the stair. Um, expressively, this is quite interesting. It, it, it starts to move away, actually, from, <coughs> from the typical tropes or language of classical architecture. And in fact, the, it, it, it seems to almost look much more at the kind of muscular ar architecture of Roman infrastructure, such as aqueducts, for, in for instance, when you're inside. It's it's very let's say thick and dense elements which with you know with big walled sections and piers and you're always let's say exposed to these very aggressive openings which face one onto each other. Actually, there's in, in relation to Fuga, which was a big fan of San Felice, there is a stair in Rome in Palazzo Corsini which has a very similar effect. Um, yeah, so this is as you walk up and then every time it frames the garden at the back. So in fact, it is, it is a structure this thick, which is between a courtyard and a garden. So it's, it's this kind of buffer between these two dimensions of the palazzo, which at the same time, it articulates all the life inside it. Yeah, this is the, the relationship between the two openings of two ramps going up and down. That's the window onto the garden at the back. Now, in terms of expression, you'll see that these are there are these distorted openings, which seem fairly arbitrary, but in fact there was a, a, large, a lot of talking going on in Europe at the time on how one would deal with the question of the oblique. In fact, there is, a, there is Juan Caramel, which is a Spanish priest, uh, mathematician, physicist, 
and improvised architect who writes an entire treatise called Architectura Civil, Civil Recta e Obliqua, where he tries to, in fact, canonize uh, these exceptional moments within uh, architectural expression, where you are, let's say, in fact, in fact, it comes from a very painterly approach, which, uh, which deals with, let's say, a correct mathematical way to distort architectural elements, let's say, in relation to perspectival view, if you're doing a painting, but also to these very unique moments, such as a stair, for example, when you are uh, in, a, in actual fact building. Uh, San Felice might or might not have looked at this book, but it was a very influential book at the time. Uh, in fact, Caramwell built also a project in Italy in... Um, where is it? It's a piazza with a church at the end, which has a curved Vigevano. facade. Vigevano, exactly. exactly. And, um, but here, you know, we can also tell the difference. So if Caramel, for example, theorized that in, in, if you have a column between a straight section and an oblique one, you always put the line in which it breaks at the exact middle of the column, we already see how San Felice starts to develop his own, let's say, approach to the matter, which is in fact much more refined and elegant. And this is most, let's say, noticeable also if you compare it with the people who have later tried to emulate him. So, for example, this is by an engineer architect called Atanasio, and it's actually 200 meters away from that palazzo. But here you can see how that the architect is still, in some way, a victim of a post-lintel system, which in fact is abandoned entirely here, no? where we have a much more seamless and smooth, let's say, expression. This is the case somehow with all the imitations um, of San Felice's, uh, San Felice's particular solution, which are actually very many, many, many in Naples, and which somehow give an idea of how this peculiar, let's say, uh, exceptional case ended up be becoming, if you want, an assertive type of, um, of let's say, nobiliar dwelling within the old town, uh, which I guess brings us back on the general conversation we can have later, maybe on how we can de define this metropolitan architecture in the first place. Maybe the most interesting case, which is actually what I'm working on now, is actually how to connect this to Fuga, who works later in Naples on a large poorhouse, a cemetery, and a granary building, but which beforehand, and almost during the same years, San Felice had built his own palace, has this very peculiar staircase at the, actually at the, when you enter in the courtyard of Palazzo della Consulta at your back which develops exactly along that motif, and we know that Fuga was in fact in Naples before building his palace, and he probably would have visited the construction site of that building, which was one of the most, let's say, uh, ex um, exotic yeah, novelties which everyone would go see in, during its construction. And uh, this is also, you know, to address that question you were saying before, of Fuga being a late Baroque architect, yeah? And not an early, if you want, Enlightenment one. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is kind of a way to make an interesting hinge between this staircase is a way to make an interesting hinge between these two these two definitions of it. There's also another interesting hinge, which is Yuvarra, actually, mm -hmm. which is the big, actually, unspoken in all this situation. And he's like he's the the champion of Italian architecture, very unmentioned at the time. But that's another story, and we have another occasion. That's it. Fifteen minutes. Oh. <laughs> Thank you for the picture. <coughs> I think Andrea yeah. should ask the first question. Yeah, when you say that Yuvara is the unspoken uh, hero of this uh, of this tale, you know, about stairs and uh, solutions, the diagonal. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm curious now. So could you please? Yeah, sure. No, it's. It, it, this is actually a, an, another side project I'm developing now for a symposium that will be in April at the Court of where they asked us to choose specific architectural drawings to take out from the archives and talk about, you know, let's say, a round table of 10, 15 people. And I have started to do research on a series of studies Juarez has done, has, has been drawing for um, stage sets for the Teatro Toboni in, in Rome. And now, what's interesting with Yuvarra, independently from that, is that somehow 
the young Guevara in Rome is one of the most, let's say, he wins this very big competition, in fact, done by Albani himself, uh, sorry, Toboni himself, I think. I'm not, I'm not entirely, I don't remember that exactly. And he is, let's say, the, the figure everyone is looking at at the time. So, for example, we know that Caspar von Bittel sends Luigi van Bittelli to study under Juvarra during the years he's doing these theater drawings, and which will curiously, let's say, uh, which where he probably picks up many of the motifs which will curiously re reoccur within the Reggia and Caserta, but also within the drawings with, which van Bittelli did for the theater in Caserta. And this, let's say, is part of a side chapter in the importance of theater actually in. in uh, in early enlightenment as a space, which actually takes over, if you want, the the sacred the pulpit of religion as a as a um, as a proper, let's say, political um, site. Um, on the other hand, there is uh, there is Fuga, which famously for his first project uh, for the Albergo dei Poveri, in fact, um, drafts an option which is a most literal transla translation of a project Yuvar had done for the um, consulta, for the papal consulta in Rome 10 years before. And it's a one-to-one, -one, it's a one-to-one -one borrowing of that. So, Juara is a bit this figure which, let's say, has a very, and also San Felicia, in fact, is, uh, is if you want, um, of, it's always associated with Juara, because Juara also comes to Naples and does a few uh, church decorations for, I don't remember which festivity, for the Duomo, which, um, you know, obviously were a very important case study for San Felice himself. This was at, at the beginning of the 1700s, so at the same time he's doing the stage sets for the Octoboni Theater, and San Felice being himself engaged in the construction of ephemeral architecture was for sure, uh, if you want, studying Juarra's solutions. On the other hand, I mean, the other fascination I have with Juarra is, uh, first of all, he's an architect of extreme talent, which uh, demonstrates somehow a, a very, a very, let's say, refined capacity to develop bespoke solutions for very peculiar problems. And on the other hand, he is also an architect which probably most of all uh, exposes, let's say, a, an approach which is typical of early enlightenment, which is very eclectic, but not in, in not eclectic meaning like flamboyantly, if you want, uh, over the over the bar but, uh, let's say, eclectic in a sense of, let's say, being able to uh, make use of different, if you want, architectural expressions or languages depending on the case. So, which, which of course, is something which we can refer back to von Erlach, but which is also actually one of the biggest qualities of Fuga, for instance, who is able to create the most austere, almost Jansenist, I don't know how to say this in English, Jansenist architecture, at the same time, he's doing Palazzo della Consulta, for example. Well, um, of course, it's a danger that already I would be happy if you can give as long an answer to my question. <laughs> uh, uh, well, but maybe it's a, it's, it's a difficult question to answer because I even don't exactly know how to formulate the question. Uh, your part here, I mean, I think we wanted you to have you here for two reasons. I think, first of all, because what you bring in in terms of, I mean, the particularity of the work of Fuga, as uh, San Felice is, is extremely, I think, interesting and, and beautiful on its own right, uh, on a tectonic level, on the kind of, there's, I mean, especially the, the staircase he does for himself, let's say his own palazzo seems to look today, maybe perhaps from a Swiss perspective, so contemporary, yeah. that you're <laughs> almost shocked, right? I mean, I think that's, that's an aspect of it, I mean. Certain Swiss architects would be happy to, yeah, yeah. to make such things. Um, at the same time, there is, and you, you, you touched upon that, uh, this argument of making, in a way, a facade for a building which is inside the building. Uh, because you have these very narrow streets, you have these big gates, and then in some strange way you can bring the facade deep inside the building. Yeah. That is another, I think, very important, very fascinating thing of, 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 of the architecture you show. But then, of course, if you try to zoom out even more, and, and you, I mean, you know that you're the third, third fragment of our attempt, of course, together with students, to define what today could be metropolitan architecture, in which I think the default answer uh, is not allowed, which is, ah, it's building for within the metropolis, but rather an architecture which tries to carry in itself a kind of promise of the metropolis. I mean, to recall for ourselves, 
uh, Christopher Haraway, he brought in, I mean, amongst other topics, this idea of this, uh, I would say, collective uh, living, but which is highly individualized. I mean, to a certain extent that you are totally on your own, but uh, you're part of an infrastructure which is so big that you can do things which you can otherwise not do. I think when we saw last last time, uh, made in, so uh, um, uh, uh, he, um, uh, Francois Charbonnet, he, uh, he was of course, and we also asked him to talk about his own architecture, he was showing this, uh, I would have to say, most high-tech kind of architecture, uh, highly expressive in terms of, uh, you know, the bold and, and, and very often, by the way, made out of steel uh, kind of system. In some strange way, when you look at these San Felice uh, buildings, they seem to touch both. But maybe that's purely projection. And mm. I was wondering uh, how you see that. I think the, um, the interesting slide probably to go back to. The matrix, basically, with all the stairs, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, if I think if there is one, um, well, there's more than one, but if there is one, if you want, instance where we can start to talk about the stairs, something which is more than itself, somehow is in relation to, if you want, this this assertive type, no? which is the open stair in Naples, and uh, which, which, as I kind of briefly explained, but one should, in fact, explain much better, uh, which is actually born out of, out of a very idiosyncratic, let's say, urban condition. So, the, Naples is a case where collective dwelling, if you want, as we refer to today, so therefore the idea of building, of having your own house within a larger compound united by a staircase, a common staircase or a common circulation, is in, fa is in fact one of the cities to have it earliest, precisely because of the, let's say, uh, the spatial, if you want, uh, how do you say, constraints which the city posed to its inhabitants, which would continuously build on top and on top and on top. And to a certain extent, you know, we can also say that this way of living has largely or vastly conditioned, I would say, and I would love to think, <laughs> a certain approach to, uh, to, let's say, the idea of, uh, of a neighbor itself in a city like Naples, or the idea of private or ideas such as private and public affairs within, uh, let's say, domestic compounds, for example, in a city like Naples. And a, the whole, if you want, uh, theatricality of Neapolitan life. So that is, I think, definitely a discussion to be made. On the other hand, we can talk here, I think, of, of I don't know if metropolitan maybe is the right, the right word, but maybe it's more cosmopolitan, if you want. So an architecture which is at, at once it's a strongly rooted to its context, to the point that you know it's 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 almost kind of indiscernible from it. But also, uh, if you want, refers to a whole system of ideas which is which goes totally beyond its its immediate reach, and um, which I very briefly tried to mention somehow. So then there's this this idea of, of this this parasite, no? like these stairs which punctually somehow through a single typology infect, if you want, the entirety of the urban tissue and in a very discreet way, uh, let's say, very much affect, let's say, the way the, the city works, yeah, at a smaller scale. So this, I think, is also an, an, interesting, an interesting matter, no? Because I always actually ask myself, okay, what could be another case in which a single architectural element has been so, if you want, uh, how, so assertive and so deterministic for the way in which, let's say, a city works. And I kind of struggle to find it. It's more easy to find it, for example, in le legislative measures. So, for example, when a city says you can't build more than four, then you start to have you know, a series of consequences to that which develop into traditions. No? Yeah. Um, so that's kind of easier. It's easier to, to let's say, to to find it within that kind of uh, framework, but uh, it's it's less easy, I think, to find it, uh, let's say, in, in, in similar terms to some finishes on. And that, I think, is possibly something interesting. 
or it could maybe be the, but it's true that there's a technological aspect to it, not. it could maybe be the, the elevator and the loop, yeah. you know, for example, but, but that's, I think, on the edge, you yeah. know, uh, yeah. being the elevator almost an invisible element, yeah. you know, it doesn't play such a role. Uh, but I think, I mean, uh, coming back but to But sorry, this, just very briefly, yeah, I would please. also dare to say that this is a technological aspect too. Oh, ah, yeah. Even though it has no wiring. No, 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 true, true. True. <laughs> no, and coming back to the stairs, I mean, I think there's indeed this, this uh, again, weird parallel, no? Because, let me say, as ancestors, no, of this uh, metropolitan architecture, which were, we were obviously looking at, uh, and being Paris now, the, the center of our attention for the first semester. We were obviously looking at a certain high-tech architecture, as Catherine was mentioning, and uh, it's, it's a yeah, sauvage, and, but even later, let me say, Nouvelle, and obviously if you talk about Paris, uh, you have to talk about uh, Bobourg, and, and then suddenly I think there's, there's this, again, weird analogy, you know, that the stairs from an element which was completely uh, hide, no, hidden, hidden before, yeah. sorry, uh, during opera renaissance, no, that suddenly uh, comes from uh, the first, uh, yeah, the first, no, it's the yeah. first thing you see in a building. Yeah. And if you consider Bobur, you consider, I don't know, the Lloyds in London, no? Suddenly, with yeah, yeah. this sort of architecture, the stairs is the absolute protagonist. Yeah. You know? It comes to the facade, it defines the way in which you look at the building, even defines the way in which you think of the building. So yeah. the building is a building of flows, yeah. no more than a building of staying, I would say. Or, or so I think it's it's interesting this sort of transformation yeah. and how the elements becomes uh, yeah. Yeah, central to a certain idea. No, of it's true. It actually yes, actually I no, I didn't state it so so clearly that that uh, the, the intelligent thing here is with with all these projects is in fact that a an issue which is a if you want a very let's say matter of fact functional issue here assumes if you want the core expressive uh, if you want the yeah, function the problem becomes the architecture that, that is yeah. Really interesting yeah. right? yeah. and, and as you started with your in fact we can maybe even more so is probably the another one to look at in these instruments mm. uh, I, I, I still have trouble to believe but that has more to do with the fact that I cannot understand how people lived in buildings in the 17th or 18th century, I have sometimes trouble to understand that it was one house or a house with one rented floor. As you said when I visited it with you, uh, well, many of the buildings were also his own. Yeah, you had the feeling that it was always meant uh, as a building for many. Yeah, no, his <coughs> own for sure it was meant at least for two. Well, at least. Because there was the Duke renting the, the, the flat downstairs because San Felice was a, was a was noble of birth but also not so rich. Mm -hmm. so. So somehow, uh, let's say, he had to recoup the money he had borrowed to build this palazzo by renting out the floor. But then another Which is also, for example, what happens in, in, uh, in Tristan Zara's house in Los, no? Yeah, Where the, the floor rent. immediately above the, re the, the house of Tristan Zara is actually a floor to rent out, True. to recoup building costs. But then there's also something else to it, which I feel is less apparent on the pictures, but much more when you're there. But you, you mentioned it, I think, briefly. The stairs are the protagonists, as you said, I mean, in location, in, in, you know, in composition, but also in the way they are detailed, in the sense that the rest of the building yeah. often looks far less cheaper done, yes. uh, more trashy yeah. to some extent, which I find also in relationship, I would say, to the studio very interesting. Yeah. You know? So it's this kind of, uh, where what's the hierarchy of, yeah. of your architecture to a certain extent? Yeah, no, that's that's true. In fact, in fact, uh, you have, I mean, this has to do, I think, with the... Um, I mean, probably a broader topic, you know, which is when you when you start a project, particularly with projects like these, where you have where you have a given context and uh, budgets which are usually not so high. In fact, for palazzo standards, where do you put the energy, and how, let's say, do you and how do you deal with, let's say, contextual questions? And here, it's exactly that. You know, the if you want, if you, if we have these signature pieces somehow, which obviously are related to the rest, but which clearly, let's say, are, are, are centers of gravity somehow in, mm -hmm. for the, in terms of architectural expression. Questions from the public? Yes, here are the first kind of the <laughs> oh, just, just to follow up with this discussion, it's maybe very interesting also to note that you started by showing these festive machines mm. that are an element of scenography. Yeah. And in a way, 
this staircase could be even interpreted as scenography themselves yeah, yeah. and a kind of outrageous type of scenography that is a collision, you know, between architecture and the world in a, it's in a very technological way, right? Like so that. if you if you look at this staircase, oop, no, not this one. <laughs> <laughs> this one. Yeah. So this staircase here. No, because I wanted to go faster, but whatever, let's do it <laughs> as it's done. So if you if you look at this staircase here and then compare it to that tower I showed before, it's in fact exactly the same element which just kind of occupies a courtyard rather than being freestanding in a square as it as that element actually is. <laughs> Which again suggests that in fact it's probably which has some much more to do. It's probably something which has even though this is a later project, so this is 1740. The other one was around 17 mid 1720s. It also kind of suggests that if you want this this choreographic element is as important as was the functional one of accessing if you want two parts of the palazzos with one stair and without a loggia. So even there, it's like it's an economy of means somehow, which allows you to do you know two things with one, with one with one thing. So, but yeah, that definitely there's a there's like the link is 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 super strong. More questions. <laughs> but this I think is also interesting. This this idea of the the gravity, if you want, of the design. In, of uh, these entire complexes on these staircases is actually, I think, one of the most interesting features of Fuga's architecture always. Where um, mostly, uh, by my, uh, my interest in, in Palazzo Corsini and in the Albergo in Naples, you have an extreme economy of means in dealing with, let's say, the organization of space, in dealing with the expression on the facade, except for these two exceptional moments. In On the one hand, in the um, in the Palazzo Corsini, in the staircase, which was a stair gallery, in fact, where the um, the bishop, because that was the cousin of the Pope, um, had, Neri Corsini, had all his collection of statues. And on the other hand, in the Albergo dei Poveri, which is... The church. Yeah, exactly. Which is... Do I have it? Yes. That, build, that huge oh, building up there. Uh, I could zoom out, but whatever. The church in the center, which is effectively the only true, uh, uh, if you want, uh, intense moment, experientially speaking. Yeah, which connects everything, actually. Yeah, which actually connects everything and, and you know, which, which acts as a core for the entire project, which otherwise is a very dry building, which even in art history is, now, is always kind of neglected as a kind of late failure, late experiment. Like something which arrives too late, in fact, because at, at, that's kind of an, that's an, maybe that's also an interesting case for the brief metropolitan architecture. His his uh, Fugas projects under Charles of Bourbon, which actually are located in Naples but address the entire reign, so from some, from Naples to Palermo. Mm -hmm. So buildings which are incredibly out of scale for their context, but which uh, let's say geographically and uh, which uh, managerially have to do with uh, with a much larger scope. So does that inspire more questions? No. no more questions? No? Nothing? I think they... I, they I have another oh, one, a yeah. short one. <laughs> and we were noticing you know, before that uh, in many of the stairs, uh, uh, obviously the, the geometry, you know, the, the fact that you got the flights, you no. Know, and so the diagonal lines are even uh, obviously implicating a, a sort of um, perspectival, uh, how to say, distortion. No? Yeah. I mean, you, you, you wonder whether you got this sort of, uh, how to say, intentional uh, playing with the perspective, which is very much what you think about Baroque, no? among other things. Uh, you wonder which is the, the consciousness, no? uh, because obviously if you are staging the stairs as the main element, then suddenly you got in your hands a, a, a formidable uh, tool, no, in order to even play with perspective. And when you look at them from the courtyards, no, uh, seeing that, let me say that, the, for example, the vaults which are going down, no, and 
Uh, it's very much again uh, an incredible, how to say, trick. No? Yeah. To there is uh, there is in, um, there is a, an interesting theory actually. An architect who is living in the palazzo at the moment is developing by drawing it all, which has to do with the, the vaulting of these arches, but mostly those where he is kind of trying to prove that the last ones have are much more tilted than the ones below so that you could see let's say their under part mm -hmm. from the bottom so from one perspective in fact from one point of view which of course you know means that uh, the, yeah this comment that you made is is, uh, is entirely pertinent uh, even more so you know this this, uh, this whole idea of distortion is in fact a painterly problem before it is an architectural problem so it has to do, for example, with, uh, and it's a problem which you know, architects have dealt with since, since uh, Piero della Francesca. Uh, how do you, you know, properly distort a Corinthian order with mathematical rules which are, let's say, as rigorous as those of uh, Vitruvius, no? And uh, in paintings, in painting, obviously, maybe it's, it's slightly easier, but in the, um, in the case of building, actually, these elements, uh, it's more tricky. And the, that's kind of the central point of debate, in fact, of Guarini and Caramel, when they have this, ex, this epistolar exchange, where Guarini, in fact, accuses Caramel of uh, having no clue whatsoever of how you build, how to build, and what it means to work tectonically with elements. And, uh, and let's say, claiming that, in fact, he is an architectural amateur and, and should, uh, should spend more words on painting rather than building. But what you see also here with uh, Sartovic's um, own uh, palazzo is that he moves towards uh, an architecture of wall rather than elements, right? Mm -hmm. So as a result, he can simplify his uh, kind of building. So he, I think, it seems like he. I mean, also the other much more narrow. I forgot the name. Uh, the other uh, court. Yeah, the the one. With the uh, fancy colors, yeah, this one uh, here. Uh, I mean, in a way, there's so little detail that he's able to get away with it. Yeah, yeah. No, yes, that's. Uh, yeah, the, it, here less. Like here, you still yeah, here have if you want. The other one very much. much. Yeah, but the other one very much. It's, it's they're almost reduced. Like, the orders are almost reduced to lines. Mm -hmm. To yeah, to guiding lines. And all. This you know, it's, it's what you notice in in the people who have tried to do these stairs again in Naples. Yeah, exactly. They have which, this trouble of doing yeah, they have this yeah. trouble always because they want to keep yeah here it's mm -hmm. just here where they even steps down uh, here where you have this very kinky moment where something diagonal ends up into a, a, a capital. This one is better. That's uh, Nicola Tagliacozzi Canale, which is a great great architect. But who didn't get a lot of commissions because he was slightly later than San Felice at the time in which the, the two big guys in Naples were Fuga and Vitelli. And, uh, and then there were the, ar the architects associated to them, uh, I forgot the names, but you know, they were the, one get, the ones getting all the jobs. And San Felice would only be able to do these temporary actually structures once again because uh, they were getting all the big commissions. In fact, the only big commission San Felice gets is the gardens of Capodimonte. And uh, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> sad story. Sad yeah, story. sad Let's story. Let's finish with the sad story. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.